the United States and Bible prophecy. Let's begin with that subject this morning. And that begins with a story. On July 2nd, 1776, the Continental Congress was meeting in Philadelphia, and they were trying to decide whether or not to declare independence from England or not. And then there was quite a vigorous discussion. They stayed up pretty much all night. Uh, the vote was deadlocked. The same amount from one side as for the other. And they realized that one of the delegates from Delaware was not there. One delegate from Delaware had vo Delaware voted for independence. The other voted against independence. And the third one was working in his farm. So the word got out there, and he got on his horse, and he got back as fast as he could to Philadelphia. In the meantime, there was a bell ringer whose grandson, who told his grandson, I want you to watch this. I am for independence. If they vote for independence, I want you to tell me as soon as possible, just run back to me and I'll ring the bell. Sure enough, the gentleman from Delaware made it to the Continental Congress and he cast his vote and his vote was for independence. And the little boy ran out and said, ring, Grandpa, ring for liberty. And that's the story behind Liberty Bell. And that is the first time a nation was born on the principles of religious liberty. You know, the United States Constitution guarantees liberty and freedom. The, the United States has been the great champion of liberty and freedom throughout the world. Um, the French tried that during the French Revolution, but it didn't quite work because their motives were not the same. The French wanted to get back at the church they were so tired of the church, the medieval church, so they went all the way to being atheists. But the, the, the colonists in America got it right. They didn't discharge, they didn't discount God. They said, God is very important in our lives, but different people have different ways of worshiping Him, understanding what He is like, and everybody ought to be free to honor Him and worship Him in the way that He chooses. Will these historic freedoms ever be challenged? How could that possibly be? This is America, right? This is the land of the free, right? Does the Bible talk about the United States? Well, we're going to see that today. Last night, if you were with us, we talked about Revelation, the first part of Revelation 13. Today, we will talk about the second part of the book of Revelation in C what we can learn today. Let's begin. Revelation 13, verse 11, second part of that chapter. John says, Then I saw another beast, another beast. Remember we talked about one last night. Coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Whoa, that is different. A beast that has horns like a lamb, and a lamb represents who in the Bible? Jesus Christ, but speaks like a dragon, and the dragon represents who in the Bible? The devil. Mm. This is one sneaky beast. Remember, beast represents political powers. That's based on the council in Daniel, I mean, the verse in Daniel 7.23. These are political powers. And so we find that in Daniel 7, you had a lion with wings that represented uh, Rome, and then you had a bear that represented Medo Persian, you had a leopard that represented Greece, and you had this undescript monster that represented pagan Rome. Now, there are three questions we need to answer regarding this new beast that doesn't come out out of the sea. All the other beasts in Daniel 7, as well as in Revelation 13, the first beast comes out of the sea. That means they come out of populations and nations and tongues and people. But this beast comes out of the earth by contrast. So what do we learn? First of all, where does this power come 
from. Where does this power come from? Revelation 13, 11 says, I saw another beast coming out, out of the earth. In the Bible, we learn about the church in the wilderness. The wilderness is a place where there is no population. There are no nations. There are no tongues and people where very few people may live. And that is the time when the church went underground during the Middle Ages, the time of the apostasia, according to Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It is at that time that the true people of God, those who were faithful to the Word of God, had to read the Word of God secretly. And they went into the wilderness, as it were. They were not up out in in, in the open because they would be persecuted. Revelation 12 tells us about that, and tonight we will explain that in much more detail. The dragon persecuted the woman, and that woman had gone into the wilderness. Verse 14 says, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Who is the serpent? The devil, right? So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth. And I remember what water means, right? Spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman to be carried away with the flood. The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, the Bible says. Going back, this is what's happening. During that, those, that, the dark ages in Europe, the, the place where there were a multitude of nations and tribes and people and ethnic groups, etc., tongues, that is where Christianity rose, but it went apostate, it, went, it, it, it apostatized, and uh, the, the, the official church, the state church, began to persecute those people who were reading the Bible or, or not falling in line with the church. Because of that, when America was discovered, people from England, people from Scotland, people from Holland, people from France, people from, the, the, um, from Germany, from, the, from Scandinavia, found in the New World a place where they could go, and they could be free to worship God any way they wished, as opposed to enduring harassment to persecution and alienation in Europe. And so, going back to verse 16, the earth helped the woman, the earth helped the woman, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. That multitude, you know, the devil working through those nations and powers that sought to drown the faithful people of God, they found help by crossing the pond, as it were, by coming over to America. And so America, the earth helped the woman, swallowing that flood. And this is a nation built of immigrants. I'm one of them. I was 18 when I came to this country. And I came to this country because my dad wanted to come to this country when he was 19. Of course, I wasn't around when he was 19. But it took him 25 years to get to that. And so when my mother and father came, I was a teenager in a boarding high school having a good time, president of the class, friends all over, girlfriends, no, just, um, just friends all over. And I said, why do I need to go to America for? I'm having a good time in Argentina. I have my friends there. I have a career. I was going to do architecture. But the Lord had different ideas, you know. There was a time when uh, somebody came and spoke for a week at a school in the book of John. The book of John, John warmed my heart. And I, like a number of others, we gave our hearts to the Lord Jesus in full surrender. And we said, Lord, use us. We want to be used by you. And I started rethinking this architecture thing and thought, well, maybe I should serve him full time in some sort of ministry. 
maybe as a Bible teacher, maybe as a minister, maybe as a physician, maybe as a missionary. I didn't know where. That led me to come to this country. And when I came to this country, I didn't know a word of English, not one word. People would say to me, how are you? And I would say, thank you. <laughs> but you know, there is hope even for more, the most desperate. And so time went by and I learned the language and I married a beautiful American girl by the name of Lisa from Iowa. We have three beautiful American children. If there's somebody who appreciates this country, that's me. Because I didn't have to be, I, I was legally in this country, I didn't have to become an American. Um, but I chose to. I chose to. I believe that this nation was really blessed by God. And I believe this is a nation of destiny. And I believe that God has used this nation to impact many, many, many other people on the most positive possible way. And that is how the pilgrims came. They came because this is a place where the, where the open arms, where so you can worship God any way you want to, as your conscience dictates. You do not have to live in a place where the church and the state are together. You do not have to answer to a king as to how you should worship God or what you should believe. You can worship God based on what you know God to be. This new beast, however, in Revelation 13, comes out of the earth, uh, out of an unpopulated area. All right? What is the second question? When does this power rise? Revelation 13, 10 says this is a transition between the first beast and the second beast, between the sea beast and the land beast in Revelation. It says, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. What happened there? Well, for 1260 years, the church, the official church, the Christian church was persecuting those who wanted to be faithful to the word. They let them captive and eventually it would be taken captive. And we told that story last night. Remember February 13, 1798, Napoleon says, I am going to do away with the papacy, took the Pope away, incarcerated him in a palace in, in southern France until he died, and the papacy experienced a deadly wound. But for 1260 years, that was the, the dominance of the church was finally broken. That's what the time, times and half time mean, by the way. In Jewish reckoning, in time is a year's period, 360 days. Times is two years period, 720 days. Half a time would be half a year period, 180 days. You add them all up, you end up with 1260. The third question is, how does this power rise? I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. Two horns. Now, horns are symbols of what? Do you remember? Power. Symbols of power. Now, this is the power of a new nation, a nation that is built on freedom and democracy and on Christian values because those are the people that populated this nation. This is one of the things that I, I, I chuckle every time I go to Australia. They, you know, I say, there's a lot of similarities. I lived in California for many years. I said, there's a lot of similarities between California and Australia. You know, all these happy people, all the sun, you know, beaches and all of that. Yeah, he says, except that you guys were colonized by nice people, religious people. But we were all criminals in the past. If you know the story of Australia, you understand what I'm saying. We were a very unique nation. How this was built. Christian values, freedom, and democracy. There are no crowns in this beast. This is the only beast that has no crowns. The first beast had crowns. In other words, it represented the power of a monarchy. 
kingly power. I stood in the center of the sea. They saw it, and I saw a sea rising out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and his, and his horns ten crowns. Crowns represent kingly authority. Lack of crowns then indicates freedom from that imposing authority. A very unique nation, a very unique power. Horns are a symbol of power. The second beast derives its power from political and religious freedom. That's where our power comes from. The power of our congregated individual opinions, the power of the vote, the power of, of uh, sharing personal ideas and being heard, the power of freedom and democracy, which is an amazing development in the history of society because we have never ever seen anything like this not even Rome in the times of the Senate not Greece in their heyday has seen what this nation has seen in the last 200 years so this lamb-like beast arises when the first one is taken captive the first one was taken captive in 1798. That's the time when the new one rises up. It arises in a relatively unpopulated area as opposed to the population meant by the many waters where the other beasts come from. Here's George Townsend writing about America, the mystery of her, America, come, coming forth from vacancy. Like a silent seed, we grew in, in, into an empire. Quietly, out of nowhere, if you will. The lamb-like beast, the power of the lamb-like beast would not come from kingly authority and it would absorb European religious persecution. And so the, the conclusion is quite clear. What is the only nation that really fits this description? The, the nation that best, clearly best description, fits this description is our nation, the United States of America. You say, wow, I didn't know we were talked about in the Bible, we'll see that a little bit more. You see, it is that liberty, you know, in New York Harbor, all of those people, and, and there are many people that go back and their forefathers have gone through that harbor and seen that, that, that symbol of freedom, and they have, their hearts have leaped with joy saying, I have another chance. Will liberty be ours forever? And uh, I am asking that question because that's a serious question. We are the champions of individual rights. We hold other people to the fire regarding individual rights. Will that ever be different in our great nation? According to Revelation 12, I mean 13, things will change. Look at what it says in verse 12. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Amazing statements. Amazing statements. What is this image? What is this image? An image is a, is, is a likeness of something, right? It reflects the real substance, right? That's an image. Hmm? A mirror is not you. It reflects who you are, right, when you look at it. The sea beast, papal Rome, we talked about it last night, is a church-state union. That is what made it so devilishly problematic 
when the power of the state accompanied the misinterpretation of Scripture or the traditions in the name of religion, it became a church-state union. That is the sea beast. Therefore, the land beast will experience the same thing, a church-state union. And we say, how could that possibly be? In America, we have a wall of separation between church and state. But that wall is crumbling, my friends. That wall is crumbling. And as we see that more and more, legal um, briefs and judgments from the Supreme Court and more and more rhetoric, rhetoric, even from, you know, strongly from Christian sources, want to tear down at that wall. Church and state will unite to enforce religious freedom. But let me tell you this, revival in our country, you know, we want revival. This is why, this is why people want to, to make laws that will make us more Christian or that will make us follow God or that will make us be more faithful to this whole statement of one nation under God. But the problem is when you legislate that, you get into trouble, into deep trouble. The same trouble that we experience by history. And those who do not learn from history are bound to repeat their mistakes. The only way we can get revival in our nation will not be by legislation, but by personal consecration to Jesus and His Word. Don't you agree? It is not by telling your neighbor you got to be more saintly, you got to go to church, or you got to do this, or you got to do that. It is by you surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus, the, the Lord of this word. Invite Jesus working through you on behalf of others. That is how a revival takes place. Does the Bible give any indication of end time events in light of this union? Yes, the Bible does. In fact, the Bible talked about Babylon. You remember we talked about it on Wednesday? Babylon. Babylon the Great that has been judged and has fallen in Revelation 17. In Revelation 18, we're given even more details about what will happen in the last days about that. That Babylon that now rides in a separation of church and state. The state is the beast and, 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 and she is the church that will be amalgamated eventually. It will come to be one what do we read from Revelation 18? We read these events. Her sins, verse 5 will say, says, her sins have reached to heaven. Now, tell me about that. Do you think that in our nation, we are becoming more and more wicked, or are we becoming better people? I remember when I came to this country in 1975, somebody from my hometown had come in 1960. Four. And he told me that in 1964 in California, nobody bothered to lock your car. Can you think of that? You know, going to town, going to the mall today without locking your car? No, they didn't do it because nobody bought, you know, because the society was clean and, you know, there was hardly any crime, at least where he lived. That certainly is not the case now. That certainly is not the case now. There's a lot of danger out there. In fact, um, one of the biggest problems for our government is no longer, it's not such, it's not simply foreign intrusion, terrorists. One of the biggest problems is homegrown terrorists because they go below the radar. They look like us, they talk like us, they function like us, they know everything about us. But if Tim McVeigh had anything to do with that, we should have learned from 1995. Remember, the, the, the Oklahoma, you know, pfft, 300 people died. All of a sudden, those people didn't come from the Middle East. They came from the heart of America. The Bible says in verse 7, she has lived luxuriously. Now, that really fits us. And everybody does. And it says, well, that's America right there. Mm-hmm. We have more, you know, we have more trash than people have things in other countries. We have more disposal stuff. We live as if we, all of us were rich, and, and we really are. 
Go on a mission trip someday. Go, go to even to Central America. You, know, you don't need to go very far. And you'll come back and say, whoa, we are big and rich and fat and everything. I took a sabbatical a few years ago, about 10 years, I took a sabbatical, took my whole family down to South America, and then I came back halfway through because I had some meetings out here, flew back, and I had forgotten. And, and so I rode from, from the airport, and I said, look at the cars here. Nothing smaller than an SUV. I mean, everything was big, 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 big. You go everywhere else, it's, it's small, small, small. We live like kings in this place. We have, you know, we may complain about a lot of things, you know, our economy is, is tanking, yes. But by comparison, we have it very, very good. In verse 8 of that chapter, it says that she experiences natural disasters. Is that increasing? Is it just me? Or is it that that is happening more and more in our country? It just seems to be that we're seeing more and more of these things take place. God's judgment will fall. In verse 10, it says that. You know, uh, people are, you know, that unrest in Wall Street that is unorganized, there's something in the hearts of people that are saying something is not right about what's going on. I mean, how could it be that the demonstration is over a month old in the same place, and you have people from all walks of life. It is not organized, but yet it is sustainable. Well, that says that there is a malaise that is, that is fundamental. There is a template in our nation of malaise that says something is not right. There is something that is just not right. In verse 17, we're told her riches come to nothing. Oh boy, yes, if you have money in, in stock this year, you know that the riches come to nothing because you may have lost everything you ever had already and there is nothing there that you can, you know, there is no guarantees. I told my wife about a month ago, I said, okay, honey, we just lost our retirement, you know. A spiritual decline natural disasters, social chaos, economic difficulties, all of those things will eventually lead this great nation to say, we got to tighten up. There's something wrong with this picture. We got to tighten up. And for the sake of security, we are going to start taking away some individual freedoms. That happened after 9-11. Before 9-11, I flew and I walked in and out of airports, no problem, you know, my wife could go with me all the way to the gate. Can you do that anymore? Of course not. And they're checking you out on this and that, and, and you know, we put up with that. Why do we put up with that? Because it's a matter of security. Well, get a few more 9-11s taking place, and what do you think are, are you know, we're going to be willing to give up even more of our freedoms for the sake of security. It's, it's, it's a, a no-brainer. says, oh, no, that would never happen here. Well, before 9-11, nobody would have seen that scenario take place either. Remember that America votes with its pocketbook. If, our econ if because of circumstances, because of foreign or, or homegrown intrusion, because of the, econom the economy going south, it doesn't matter how much I like whoever it is. If that is not working, out you go. I got to try something else because we vote with our pocketbooks. And that means that if we get into trouble and my lifestyle, it starts suffering, I want to make a change. In that change, even if it means the, 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 the moving away from, from individual rights, I'll, I'll make the sacrifice because I want to keep the lifestyle I have. The Bible tells us in Revelation 13 that Satan then takes advantage of this situation. Why? It introduces false re spiritual revival. See, it is, it is mostly Christians who are crying out saying, we need this great nation to go back to God. We need, and that is true, right? That is true. And so the devil says, okay, good. I'm going to push that a little bit over the hilt now. 
and, and really say, okay, now there's great spirituality, but that spirituality will be of a false nature. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Listen to what Jesus said about the time of the end. In Matthew, 20, in Ma Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God or, or heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. I, let me pause there for a moment. I know that some here and many of you out there in the downlink sites, and you may be watching in your home, are struggling with some of the things that you've been learning from the Bible. But let me tell you that it is not by saying, Lord, Lord, that we'll make it to the kingdom of heaven. It is by doing the will of God. That is the safety. We, it's when we yield ourselves to his will. That is what God says. Okay, now I know you really mean Lord, Lord. So continuing with this verse, Matthew 7, 21, 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Is that a religious exercise? Is that a spiritual thing? Absolutely. Prophesying in God's name, cast out demons in your name. That's, some, that's major. That's a graduate level religious exercise, right? Casting demons in your name and done many wonders in your name, miracles in your name. Have we not done that? And Jesus says to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So you see, what matters to Jesus is not all the religious stuff you may do, even if it is miraculous in nature. What matters to Jesus is whether or not the law of God is in your heart. Whether or not his character is in your heart, whether or not you will yield to his will, that is what makes him, makes you known to him. A lot of people today going to mega churches, great services, filled with entertainment and with miracles. A lot of people want to go to miracle temples and places like that to feel God. But the problem with feeling God over knowing God is that feelings are tricky. Feelings are tricky. And you may go one way or the other based on your feelings. God doesn't want you to know Him based on how you feel. He wants you to know Him based on who He is. And if you want to know Him based on who He is, you need to go to the source to find out who he is, and that is this word, this Bible. Isaiah 8, 20 says to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. So we may do all the miracles in the world. We may sound Christian. We may sound good. We may sound like the power of God is with us, but in reality, there is no light. There's no light there. That is a frightful concept. That's why I keep urging you. That's why I keep, you know, you say, you know, you keep harping at the same thing. I do. I only have a few days to do that. And I'm harping on the things that really matter. I really believe this is very important. That is, give your whole life to God now. Do not hold back. Do not say, I'll give you 95% of my life. But this one thing, I'm going to keep to myself. No. Give your entire life to Him. Otherwise, that one thing is the one that the devil will use against you. If the devil wanted to unite people religiously, what means would he use? What means would he? Well, we got to go back to history. The way he did it before, that was so successfully. What means did he use in early Christianity? He used the church and the state. He, he said, look, all these pagans are worshiping on Sunday. Constantine says, 
A lot of Christians are now worshiping on Sunday too, um, the basis of the resurrection. It is not what the Bible says, but it is, seems like a good tradition. Let's get that together. Let's make a law that says everybody worship on Sunday, and now we're all at the same level. If that is what the majority is doing, then politically speaking, it's an easy thing to pass. Polit politicians know that they don't, they, they, they know they don't have a chance to pass something that is only supported by a small minority. It is always the majorities. That, that's what counts. If I have the vote, if people feel this way, this, and this, is, this is what's going to happen. This is what happened in the Middle Ages to conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity. Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christian and pagan festivals amalgamated and to get paganism and Christianity now far sunk in idolatry in this, as in so many other things, to shake hands. Well, the devil is going to do the same thing. We live in a nation where we believe there's a wall, there's a separation between church and state, but that separation is being eroded, and there is more and more clarion voices saying, let's unite that, let's get that together for the sake of, for the, sake of the Christian world, for the sake of people, let's go back to God that way. Chief of Justice Re William Rehnquist a few years ago said the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. This is the chief justice saying this. It should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. That's the chief justice of the nation. The Christian coalition and many other very good Christian, otherwise very good Christian groups who have really supported Christian values, Christian family values, has been very good in many ways, also preaches the need to legislate religion in order for our country to go back to God. Redefining religious liberty, here's what we read. As the second century of the Bill of Rights draws to a close, the Supreme Court is redefining what religious liberty will mean in the third century. Broadly, the court's new approach helps conventional religions while hurting unconventional ones. What does that mean? Remember, that harks back to the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, it was one big church, and it didn't hurt anybody who simply went along with that. But if anyone wanted, wanted to be faithful to the Bible, that hurt them, all of these, these laws. And so we will see the same thing coming out of the judiciary on behalf of the majority against the minority. For the first time ever in history, the U.S. Supreme Court has a Catholic majority. Six out of nine. Now, they are, they are good jurists. They, they, they are there for that job, not to, Im not to impose their personal religious views. But you come with a package with a mindset, with presuppositions, obviously. History shows the Supreme Court has ruled in detriment of racial minorities in the past. Did you know that? This great country championing individual freedom has a number of times broken and violated individual freedom on behalf, uh, against a number of individuals. For instance, the 1857 Dred Scott decision. That was a formal sanction of slavery, right? But it says that no Negro could be a citizen of the United States. Now that seems preposterous, preposterous at this time. But it was, so, it was so clear at that time, there was no discussion about it. Or the 1908 Berea College versus Kentucky. At that time, the states, he says that, that the states can shut down private Christian colleges for welcoming Negro faculty and students. That's the wording in the decision. Now think about this, okay? Christian schools that wanted to be um, 
ample and, and gracious and brotherly could not because the Supreme Court said you're going to be penalized if you do that. Racial minority rights were also limited. Well, we know about the movement of the 60s and 70s and how a hundred years after the Civil War, a lot of the rights were not there. How about 1943, the Japanese relocation camps? These were Americans. These were Americans born and bred in California, in Washington, in Oregon. They spoke English better than I do. But they were relocated because for the sake of security, for the sake of the majority, violating those individuals' individual rights. Here's a statement by Justice William Douglas a few years ago. It seems to be plain. He was a champion of individual rights. It seems to be plain that by these laws, the states compel one under the sanction of law to refrain from work or recreation on Sunday. He's speaking about Sunday laws, which are on the books in many of the states in the South, including this one. To refrain from work or recreation on Sunday because of the majority's views on that day, the state by law makes Sunday a symbol of respect or adherence. So he's saying the majority believes this way, but it seems uh, unfair that because the majority believes this way, the minority should suffer because of it. Revival in our nation cannot come about by legislation. Only by personal consecration to Jesus and His Word. And so the union of church and state, even though on paper would seem like a good idea, aren't we? You know, why wouldn't we want that? Why wouldn't we want this nation to become more Christian? Why wouldn't we be, want our, our, our elected politicians to pay more attention to Christ and to v Christian values? All of those things are good. But as soon as you get in this, the state to run that, or the state to get its hands in it, there is always trouble, and history has taught us that that is the case. Listen to the editor. This is the editor of Christianity Today, okay? The most influential magazine, Christian magazine. He's advocating for a Sunday law in order to go back to God. A few years ago, he wrote, all business, businesses including gasoline stations and restaurants, this is as a result of the embargo, remember in the 74, 75, when, when it was difficult, if you're old enough, you may remember that. Don't raise your hand, but you may remember that, right? And, 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 and gas prices went right through the roof, and we were all desperate, and people had to wait an hour or two or longer to get gas. Young people have no clue what I'm talking about. But in those days, people were desperate to get their lives back again. Huh? Here's one way to do it, Harold Linsell says. Gasoline stations, restaurants should close every Sunday by force of legislative fiat through the duly elected officials of the people. In other words, to conserve to, you know, that's going to be better for everybody. And so the beast that rose silently will end up being the image of the previous beast that existed for the time of apostasy. Verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? Killed. Whoa, you can't be serious about this. You're talking about a death sentence? If, if the government will come to the point of a death sentence? Now, tell me something. In a democracy, how do you speak in a democracy? You know, not in a monarchy. In a monarchy, the king is the one that speaks or the queen. How do you speak in a democracy? 
You speak through Congress, right? You have representative officials. You speak through Congress. That is the legislative. How do you cause things to happen in a democracy, not in a monarchy? How do you cause things to happen in a democracy? You cause them through the judicial branch of government, right? So Congress speaks. The judicial branch of government is the one that enforces laws, legislate and adjudicate. That's exactly what is going to be taking place. Listen to Bat Robertson, well admired and respected Christian leader. Saw him just two nights ago. He has a very good and in many, many ways very good. He wrote a book a few years ago called The New World Order. In that book he wrote, the next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes is to himself. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy is a command for the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. So far, so good. Laws in America that mandated a day of rest, they're called Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of the separation of church and state, as an outright insult to God and His plan. Only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are recognized. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying, I wish that some of those laws would be back. Those, you know, not counting on those laws. The, the laws are in the, in, uh, on the books. They're just not being enforced right now. Not counting on that. It's not a good idea. Let's enforce that. Let's really make it happen. And that will be a good thing for our nation. But remember that revival in our nation cannot happen by legislation except for personal revival, personal surrender, personal consecration to Jesus and to his word. That is the key. That is the key. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 reads, if my people, this is what, this is the Bible's counsel to revival. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and do what? And heal their land. It has nothing to do with legislation. It has nothing to do with a majority over a minority. It has to do with personal surrender. It has to do with seeking after God. It has to do with praying. It has to do with, with following what God says in His Word. Hebrews 8.10 For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. When we reflect the character of God, the laws of God in His Ten Commandments, when we reflect that, you see, the, the problem with the Sadducees and the Pharisees was that they kept the law legalistically. They kept the letter of the law, and what Jesus taught them is the spirit of the law. Read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He treats the entire, you know, portions, not the entire, but major portions of the Decalogue there. And he says, the problem is, if you think that you don't break the law because, because, you, um, because you're not killing somebody physically, but you hate somebody with all your heart, you are breaking the sixth commandment. In other words, the, the spirit of that law the spirit of the law, that hatred that would motivate anybody to kill somebody else, if you withdraw from actually committing the crime, but you actually have that in your heart, you are breaking that law. Jesus came to explain that this is a much deeper thing than just the letter of the law. And that's why the Christians says that at the last days, the covenant will be with those who have taken the spirit of the Lord into their hearts, and Jesus becomes real in their lives. Even Sabbatarians, even Sabbath keepers that keep the Sabbath because it's a tradition are breaking the Sabbath. Because their spirit is not in it. Their heart is not in it. They're just doing it because they've always been doing it. 
what God is appealing to do to us is a surrender of heart. He's appealing to us to yield all to Him, to surrender all to Him, to die to self, as the apostle said, and live unto God and let God take over our lives, not part of our lives, not only segments of our uh, daily schedule, uh, schedule, not to put God in our to-do list out of 18 items. He is one of them. It's to have Him Primarily, only, it's the only thing in my schedule, and through him, all other things get done. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus understands that following him is not going to be the easiest thing in the world. But you know what? Jesus is never discouraged by that. He doesn't say, you know what? I'm, I know I'm asking you something tough. It's difficult to do. Oh, bummer. I wish it would be different. No. No. Jesus says, this is what I'm asking you to do. Just come with me. With me, we are a majority. With Jesus, you're always a majority. With Jesus, you always triumph. With Jesus, you, over, over, you always overcome. With Jesus, life is different. And the people at the end of time will have understood that. That's why the Bible says about those people, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In other words, their lives are summarized by these two principles. They have honored God's commandments in letter and in spirit. And they have trusted God with all their heart. Revival in our nation cannot be by legislation, by personal only by personal consecration to Jesus and to his word. We don't live in that nation today. The church and state is still separated, but the Bible tells me that it is coming. And I think it's going to come sooner than later. Everybody knows that our security in our nation is precarious. Just wait for a couple more 9-11s and you will see how this nation changes upside down. And say, okay, it was nice to, leave you, to let you have freedoms. Now we can't afford it. We just cannot afford it. Your time to follow Jesus is today. Your time to make a decision to follow him is today.